Hello, Allegheny College Introductory Astronomy class, and welcome to another Introductory Astronomy lecture with Bella the Cat and me, Jamie Lombardi. So today we're going to be covering the material from Monday, April 20th. The game plan is to try to complete Chapter 18 today. I like to start out with an astronomy picture of the day, and I picked one out from 2015, and it shows a supernova. This is Supernova 1994D. It's called that because it was observed in 1994. And it is a so-called Type 1A supernova. This is what we in this course have called white dwarf supernovae. And so the idea here is that those white dwarf supernovae all happen the same way. We mentioned this as a means for determining the distances to objects because these supernovae, which all happen the same way, all have the same peak brightness associated with them. And therefore, by measuring how bright they appear, we can find out how far away they are. And that is discussed down in the description below the astronomy picture of the day. And it goes on to talk a little bit about what we'll be talking about today as well, that by looking at enough white dwarf supernovae and measuring the distance to many galaxies as a result, far away, near the edge of the observable universe in some cases, we get to probe the geometry of the universe on its largest scales. And this will allow us to uh, make measurements of some of these fundamental quantities that describe the expansion of the universe. Well, let's get into it. Section 18.3 is on structure formation. And the idea is that we convinced ourselves last time, in part by looking at the cosmic microwave background radiation, in part by looking at a slew of other pieces of evidence, uh, such as rotation curves of galaxies and temperatures of hot intercluster gas, that dark matter exists. And it's nice that it exists because dark matter explains in our simulations how it is that galaxies can form so quickly within a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. And so what happens is, assisted by dark matter, protogalactic gas clouds will contract down to form galaxies rather quickly. If you put the WIMPs, the weakly interacting mass of particles, in your simulation, it contracts down quickly enough. If you don't, it doesn't. Now, these WIMPs are dark matter particles. And that means they don't radiate. And so if they don't radiate, they don't have that means by which they can lose energy. Unlike normal so-called baryonic matter, the stuff that gas and stars are made of, dark matter won't cool off. And so that explains for us why it is that dark matter exists in a larger extent over a larger region than just luminous matter. Here, this is representing a typical galaxy with the stars and the gas within it, but then extending beyond that is the dark matter. The normal matter was able to radiate away and cool and therefore contract down to smaller sizes. The dark matter wasn't. They both gravitationally interact with one another. Luminous matter, dark matter, they both interact gravitationally, so they can be centered on the same regions but the dark matter will extend out further. Now, dark matter is, to this day, still pulling things together in the universe. We talked about the Hubble expansion of the universe, how as you look out farther, things are moving faster away. And that uniform expansion describes the background motion of all the galaxies in the universe. However, there is motion superposed on top of that. Here in this particular diagram, we see the Milky Way is centered right at the origin at zero, zero. But these curves here are representing the paths that other galaxies are falling as they move in towards denser regions. And so this orange boundary is representing what we call the local supercluster, but there are other superclusters of galaxies. Um, superclusters are clusters of groupings of galaxies. And so you can see here within the local supercluster, all these galaxies are falling down towards the same location. And then in other super uh, clusters, there might be another central region in which they're falling. 
And so, although Hubble expansion explains the expansion of the universe on its larger scales, as you get to these smaller scales, you do see these deviations from it. These are deviations caused by gravity, in particular caused by the gravity of all kinds of matter, but predominantly dark matter, since there was more of that than regular matter. So as the universe expands, it gets more and more lumpy, so to speak. Here along the top of the uh, slide, we have several different cubes. These are representing the same matter in space, but at different times. This is after a half a billion years on the left and 2.2 billion years, all the way up to nearly the present day, 13.7 uh, billion years. And the size of these cubes is also expanding, 13, 35, all the way up to 140 million light years. And we're expanding the cubes at just the right rate so that we maintain the same amount of stuff with inside it, inside of it. And so the idea here is that we are expanding the cubes with the universe as it expands. And what you see is that originally there's certainly a little bit of lumpiness to it. There's over and under dense regions, but the over dense regions get more and more and more dense. And this explains the development of these voids as well as the developments of clusters of galaxies. There's a little animated figure down here in the lower right, which will show us basically the same, the same kind of thing. We'll go ahead and play that. And here we see that cube, it's advancing through time, and you see it's getting uh, more and more lumpy. There's these gigantic voids, as well as those brighter regions, which are showing clusters of galaxies. Now, as I was mentioning before, we can run simulations of the universe and how galaxies develop within it, how the universe expands with time. And when we run those simulations, they match well with observations, provided we put those weakly interacting massive particles in as dark matter. And so here in the lower right, we see some uh, data which show us locations of galaxies. Here, each one of these dots represents a galaxy. And you can see what I mean by them clustering together. They're not just these dots, these galaxies, randomly dispersed throughout this um, graph, but rather they seem to clump together. And that makes sense since gravity pulls things together. Now, if you look at the simulations that you run, you can kind of see in the background here that structure that I was talking about, that galaxies take, that the galaxies will tend to have um, a filamentary structure and how they align with one another. It's kind of like if you had a glass of milk and you took a straw and you blew air through the straw into the milk and it begins to froth up. And so you can think about the froths those bubbles as representing what the structure of the universe is like on its largest scales. Along the edge of those milk bubbles, you could imagine many galaxies being placed. And then inside the milk bubbles, you basically have the empty space of intergalactic space. And here we zoom in on progressively smaller and smaller regions. Um, now we're finally looking at something which is tens of millions of light years across and there are many galaxies there that are clumped together in this cluster of galaxies. All right, so those empty regions I mentioned, they're called the voids. Where galaxies are all clumped together, those are called the superclusters. Now, in the last section of chapter 18, we start to talk more not about dark matter, but now dark energy and the fate of the universe. As an introduction to this topic, let's go ahead and review a concept that we've seen before this semester. This is the concept of escape velocity. And I'll uh, do that with the help of this interactive figure on the left right here. I have a gun that I can fire, a cannonball. And I can fire at various speeds from 10.9 kilometers per second, holy cow, that's like seven miles per second, up to 12 kilometers per second. Let's start with the 10.9 kilometers per second. And oh, it goes up 
and it comes down in accordance with the old adage that what goes up must come down. This actually gets to um, a height here of over a hundred, and that's in thousands of kilometers, so a hundred thousand kilometers. That's far away from the surface of the earth, but still gets pulled back and within a couple days has struck back on the earth again. If we fire it a little bit faster, let's say 11.1 .1 kilometers per second, it goes higher and this horizontal axis is time, the vertical axis is vertical distance above the surface of the earth. And we see that over time it gets higher and higher and higher, but then it maxes out and it comes back and it's going to strike the surface of the Earth um, after about two weeks or so. Now, if we fire it faster still, let's go up to 11.7 kilometers per second. There it's going up, it's going up, it's going up. And you might expect, oh, yeah, you know, what goes up must come down. Not in this case. Not if you fire it faster than about 11 and a half kilometers per second that exceeds the so-called escape velocity from the surface of the Earth. And so the ball has enough kinetic energy to overcome the gravitational potential energy that it starts with, or another way to say it, it has enough speed that it would never get fall back down toward the Earth. And so, okay, fine, why are we reviewing this? Well, think about the universe as a whole as it expands. It has mass within it. It's gonna have its own gravity pulling back on it. And that's gonna slow the expansion. The gravity would tend to slow it down. And so you might expect it to be like the Earth, that as the universe continues to expand at some point, it'll slow down, maybe even stop and come back, depending on what the expansion rate is. Let's play around over here with this slider. Let's first start out with um, a very low mass density because we've measured the expansion rate of the universe. Hubble's constant is 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec, or a 22 kilometers per second per mega light year. If we have a lot of mass and we shoot the universe outward at a certain expansion rate, it's going to eventually stop and collapse and fall back in on itself. If we go ahead and we have less of the mass, then the universe goes and expands outward forever. All right, so the fate of the universe is gonna depend on how much matter there is within it. If you have a universe which has a lot of dark matter, then it's gonna expand and eventually stop and contract. Here what we're looking at is actually three different models of a universe. In all three cases, note that along this central line here, the universe looks the same. What we've done is we've suppressed one of the spatial dimensions of the universe so that we can imagine it as a little oval. And as time goes on, we're going upward along this axis. Notice that this oval is the same shape as this oval which is the same shape as this oval, the same size and shape. And so the universe in all three of those models is the same at all those times. Also notice that the edge of these curves here is the same in all three cases, the slope of the edge of these curves. And what that's representing is that the universe is expanding at the same rate. You see, we had the Big Bang when the universe was small. As we go forward in time, the universe gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And then in this case, where there's a lot of dark matter, it eventually, at some point in the future, gets smaller, smaller, smaller again until we have this big crunch. Here, where we have very little matter in our universe, the expansion just continues unimpeded. And here there's the critical case. It's a boundary between these other two types of cases. And in this critical case, there's just barely enough matter to allow the universe to expand forever. It does expand forever, but it approaches a speed of zero in that expansion at very late times. If you had any more mass in the universe, then it would eventually collapse back in on itself like on this universe to the left here. 
So depending on how much mass and therefore gravity there is in your universe, you could imagine one of these three models. Now, the amount of dark matter in our universe, as I mentioned through measurements of the cosmic microwave background radiation, and as we will say later today from looking at um, the uh, supernovae light data, the amount of dark matter in our universe is about 27% of what we need in order for it to be that critical case. And so if you just took that at face value and, and only considered matter, what that implies is that we live in one of these so-called coasting universes. There's not enough mass in our universe to slow down and halt the expansion, right? And so this model of a universe that is aesthetically pleasing at least, where the universe blows up in a big bang, so to speak, and then uh, comes back and maybe big crunches and goes again, and maybe it repeats. That's an aesthetically pleasing model of the universe, but it doesn't seem to be what these data are pointing us at. It's, these data are showing us that um, the universe would continue to expand forever. Now, let's just consider these three models and ask ourselves a thought question. Suppose the universe actually has more dark matter than we currently think. Our 27, 28% estimate is off. How would that change the age we estimate from the expansion rate? The estimated age would be larger, the same, or smaller. Okay, uh, pause it if you need to. The answer here is that if you've got more mass in the universe than you had previously recognized, you're going to be more like these graphs over on the left-hand side, right? Because those graphs on the left-hand side are the ones where you have a lot of mass slowing the expansion. And if the expansion um, was changing more quickly because you had more mass, then that means that the universe was originally expanding very quickly and the expansion rate was slowing down rather quickly to get to the current measured rate of Hubble's constant. And so it looks like, and indeed the answer here is the case, that the age of the universe would, have been, would be smaller than you had previously thought. Look at the recollapsing universe model. You don't have to go back as far in time to get to when the Big Bang was. We thought we were over here, having to go back a long amount of time to get to the Big Bang, but it turns out that we were over here, so that is a smaller estimated age for your universe. Now, here's the thing, and we'll show you some of the evidence for this in a moment, but there's more than just ordinary matter and dark matter in the universe. There is dark energy as well. It appears to be the case and the Nobel Prize was awarded for this in 2011, that the universe is not only expanding, but expanding at an accelerating rate. What? I mean, how can that be, right? If you only think about mass and gravity, if something's expanding, it's got to slow down and stop, perhaps, or at least slow down as it continues to expand. But here we have this expansion speeding up with time. It's as if there were a type of anti-gravity, and we call that anti-gravity dark energy. So the dark energy is what's responsible for accelerating the expansion of the universe. So it's not really these three models that we have to limit ourselves to, but we can also think about models of this fourth category for accelerating universes. And the accelerating universe would start out here expanding rather slowly and then over time it would expand faster and faster and faster and so because it started out with this slow expansion rate to reach what the current expansion rate in the universe is now a model like that would be older than what we would anticipate um, based on um, if we had considered any one of the other three models of the universe so the estimated age of the universe is going to depend not only on what the universe looks like now, that is how big it is and what its current expansion rate is, but in addition, the age is clearly going to depend on what that expansion was like in the past. 
and how the expansion rate evolves over time depends both on how much dark matter you have and on how much dark energy you have. Here's a little interactive figure that will allow us to play with those two variables, both the mass density in the universe as well as the strength of the dark energy in the universe. And so let's go ahead and, and do that now. Um, here at the default values, we see that we have an expanding universe, and it seems to be slowing down sl slowly with time here, right? And so this is not quite a straight line, but seems to be curved downward. If I wanted to curve it more sharply downward, what do I do? I take my universe and I put more mass density in it. And now it starts out with the same kind of upward slope, but with having more mass in the universe, that slows the expansion rate more. And in this particular case, it still didn't turn over. Now, what if I go ahead and I um, go back to my default value that I had started with, somewhere in the middle there, and I'll instead put a lot of dark energy into the universe. And so things start out similarly as before, but then look at what the dark energy does. It causes that accelerated expansion. We can see that up here. Look at how these little squares, these tiles, they start by growing rather quickly, but then they grow faster and faster and faster as the simulation goes on. That's the accelerated expansion that we're talking about there. And so in our particular universe, the breakup is something like this, that there's a moderate amount of mass and there is a, quite a bit of dark energy concentration. And so at early times, there's not the clearness of that accelerated expansion, but that becomes more and more obvious or clear as time goes on. So, you can imagine you know, playing a game where you adjust those parameters, the amount of dark matter in your universe, the amount of dark energy in your universe, and you can play the game where you figure out what's the size of your universe as a function of time. If you like, you can think about the number of galaxies littered throughout their universe um, as being constant, and that the typical distance between galaxies, therefore, is a measure of the size of the universe. If the universe has doubled in size, then the distance between galaxies, the typical distance, will have doubled as well. And so here, that kind of thing we can measure with the help of those white dwarf supernovae, more formally called type 1a supernovae. Remember, those supernovae can become as bright as the galaxy that hosts them. And so here's a picture of a couple galaxies before a white dwarf supernova in them. Here's those same two galaxies after. Look at that. The white dwarf supernova is as bright as the galaxy itself. And so by looking for and monitoring many, many different white dwarf supernovae, you can start to get a feel for how galaxies are dispersed in space way back to long times ago, way back to not too long after the birth of the universe. And this graph here is showing us on the vertical axis the average distance between galaxies and on the horizontal axis time, with zero marking the current moment in time that we're at. And the farther away you look, the further back in time you're looking. And so these supernovae data have given us these data points right here. And the models of our universe where we adjust the amounts of dark matter and dark energy They've given us these four different types of um, curves for four different models. Here's that recollapsing universe where it reaches some maximum size and then crushes back in on itself at some point in the future. Here's the critical universe that separates the recollapsing models from the coasting models. Here's one of those coasting models. And here's the accelerating model that meets the data the best. Now, if you look, the recollapsing model obviously doesn't fit those supernova light curve data, nor does the critical, and nor does the coasting. The error bars have been placed here, and this coasting model here does not fit those data. It's really only the accelerating 
model, which fits these data. And that's what, back in 2011, three different physicists won for the Nobel Prize in physics. It's for their studies. They each uh, were leading a team. There were two teams that were looking at these supernova light curve data. And they weren't communicating with one another initially on purpose. They didn't want to bias what they were discovering. And they each independently, these two groups each independently came to the conclusion that the universe was accelerating in its expansion. And neither of them believed it at first, but when they eliminated all other possibilities, they had to go with that the universe was expanding. And then they uh, shared, they wrote down their information and the story goes, they put it in envelopes um, and they met and they exchanged the envelopes and looked inside and were relieved to see that the other group had found the same thing. What these kinds of data show us is that the universe is made up of about 68% by energy concentration, dark energy, 27% dark matter, and 5% ordinary matter. And those do sum up to 100%. Among the ordinary matter, about half of a percent is stars. So one out of 10 pieces of mass or one tenth of the mass of ordinary matter is in the form of stars. But don't forget there's other types of ordinary matter like gas clouds, for example. But look at this. This is the stuff we're used to right here, this 5%. We're part of the 5%, you and me. But we're the smallest contribution to this pie chart. Dark matter is five to six times as plentiful as ordinary matter. And dark energy has an energy concentration that is more than all of the matter combined. Notice that these data here are consistent with what we said uh, we would deduce from the cosmic microwave background radiation. So here you have two independent techniques, one based off of supernova light curve data, another based off of the cosmic microwave background radiation, both giving you consistent information about what the contents of the universe are. That leads us to a story that will give us today's reading quiz answer. The answer is, I wish I blundered like Einstein. I wish I blundered like Einstein. That's the answer to today's reading quiz. What's this story all about? Well, Einstein, when he was developing his theory of general relativity a little more than 100 years ago, he thought at that time, as most people did, that the universe was static, that it wasn't expanding or contracting, but that the distances between stars and the universe was constant with time. And so in his universe, he realized that, well, with gravity, everything's gonna fall inward. So there must be some kind of anti-gravity that prevents that on large scales. And so he put in what's called the cosmological constant, a little constant, almost like a fudge factor that he added to his equations so that there could be this balance between the gravity and the anti-gravity of the cosmological constant. Now, shortly thereafter, Hubble, did his observations and announced the universe is expanding. And Einstein said, oh, I should have never put the cosmological constant in general relativity because I could have predicted that the universe wasn't static and thereby have made an even bigger name for myself. He called this cosmological constant the greatest blunder of his life. Now, here we are about 100 years later. And that cosmological constant symbolized by lambda, the Greek letter in general relativity, is a fundamental part of what we use as the consensus model for our universe, the standard Big Bang model. In fact, that standard Big Bang model goes by the fancy name lambda CDM. It stands for lambda is the cosmological constant and CDM is cold dark matter. So in our universe, we have this cosmological constant, which represents the dark energy. This is how we model the dark energy. And the idea is that this space itself has a vacuum and the vacuum has associated with it an energy. And when you create more and more space in your universe, you're creating more and more energy in the vacuum. And that helps then to lead to this accelerated expansion.
So this is what our consensus model, our standard Big Bang model of the universe looks like. It's of this accelerating form. And as far as we can tell, that acceleration is just going to continue forever, that the universe is going to expand uh, at an ever-increasing rate. Now, the age of the universe is 13.8 billion years. If you use those parameters from the previous slide, the dark energy, the dark matter, the ordinary matter, and you run it through your model, you find that the Big Bang happened 13.8 billion years ago. That's a little more than 10 to the 10 years. That's a long time for sure. But for fun, we could think forward into the future and think about what the universe will be like in the years to come. And so the first thing that I've noted here in all of these um, highlights is that in about 10 to the 13 years, notice that's a thousand times the current age of our universe right now. By that point, the stars will fade away because that star gas star cycle we've talked about, that can't continue forever. Remember that stars convert light elements into heavier elements. So hydrogen is made into helium, helium into carbon and so on and so forth. All the while you're destroying helium, but you're not really replenishing it. And so eventually that helium is going to um, be used up and eventually you're just going to be left with heavier and heavier elements. And so by about 10 to the 13 or so years from now, stars aren't going to glow like they're glowing now. If you have galaxies, they're going to be made up mostly of brown dwarfs and white dwarfs and neutron stars and black holes, all these dark things swarming around. Now, if you keep going forward in time, um, there's going to be the occasional collision. It might not be um, once but every 10 to the 15 years. So 100,000 times more than the current age of the universe. If you wait a, that amount of time, a particular object in your galaxy might collide with another object. Even so, after a total of 10 to the 20 years, you would expect 10 to the 5, 100,000 collisions for each object. So if you could imagine being some supernatural being that could be around for 10 to the 20 years, you would see these collisions between these compact objects and these brown dwarfs. Whenever you have collisions and close interactions, um, let's say you had a gravitational scattering event. So the things didn't actually merge, but they got close enough. Well, you're gonna have an exchange of energy. And what will happen is the more massive objects will um, generally sink down towards the center of the galaxy and the less massive object will get flung out far away. So you could get a lot of hypervelocity objects and a lot of settling mass segregation of objects down towards the center. Ultimately, things are going to be merging with that supermassive black hole at the centers of those galaxies. So by 10 to the 20 years or so, you could start to expect the galaxies to have uh, dissociated, disintegrated through these interactions where they spit things out into intergalactic space and other things get crushed into the supermassive black hole. So now you're left with a universe with bunches of supermassive black holes and freely flying brown dwarfs and compact objects. After about 10 to the 40 years, and this is speculative, as all of this is, there's still a lot to learn about physics, and so maybe something we learn will change what we think the universe will be like in the future. But if you believe what the grand unified theories that we're starting to develop are telling us, then the proton likely decays away. It does not exist forever. And it likely decays away in a time less than 10 to the 40 years. So by about 10 to the 40 years, though, the proton will decay away into um, subatomic particles and radiation. Things like neutral pions. And then the neutral pions quickly decay into gamma ray radiation. Right, So the proton might decay into a positron and a neutral pion. The neutral pion decays, the positron strikes some electron somewhere to, and annihilates it, and you have more radiation. And so after 10 to the 40 years and the protons have decayed, you're left with a bunch of fundamental subatomic particles and radiation. 
And if you go a Google year into the future, so Google spelled this way, G-O-O-G-O-L, that stands for the number 10 to the 100. It's a gigantic number. It's hard to fathom. The way Carl Sagan tried to get people to understand it was to say, imagine you were to write down a number, which is a one with a Google number of zeros after it. That's actually the number of a Googleplex, 10 to the 10 to the 100. But a one with 10 to the 100 zeros after it, that number would take up a sheet of paper that is bigger than today's observable universe. And so this is a gigantic number of years into the future. But if you wait that long, what's going to happen is that those black holes, those supermassive black holes that I mentioned, they'll have evaporated away. There's such a thing as Hawking radiation, predicted by Stephen Hawking, that near the event horizon of black holes, you can get particles to escape. In a regular vacuum, out of nothing, you can get these quantum mechanical uh, pair productions of particles. And usually what happens is a particle and an antiparticle are created and then immediately destroy one another. But if it happens near the event horizon of a black hole, one of the particles can escape. And now you have energy that is flowing outward. The other gets fall, falls into the black hole. But that energy that's falling outward, flowing outward, has to come from somewhere. It comes from the mass of the black hole itself. The mass of the black hole actually decreases as the black hole radiates away. And for massive objects, these time scales that we talk about to evaporate the black hole away, they're, they're gigantic, much, much larger than the uh, current time of the universe, the current age of the universe. But nevertheless, if you wait long enough, a Google years, then you will have those supermassive black holes evaporated away. And so what you're gonna be left with is a very dull universe. It's going to be filled with radiation and subatomic particles, and the distances between those particles of matter and light are going to be so great that nothing um, exciting could happen any longer. And so we right now live in a wonderful stage of the universe's evolution. We live in a stage where things are still compact enough that we can exist and that we can look out at the universe and uh, still see the galaxies around us with their glowing stars, right? At some point, it's not gonna be like that any longer. At some point, the universe is gonna be accelerating in its expansion at such a rapid rate that space will be created between us and faraway galaxies so quickly that light from those faraway galaxies won't be able to reach us any longer. Right, because it's like, imagine you had an inchworm on a stick that's trying to go from one side of the stick to the other. But if the stick is being stretched out too quickly, the inchworm can never make it to the other side. The inchworm is like a beam of light. The stick is like our universe we're within. And if the universe is expanding too quickly, light from one side of it will never be able to make it over to the other side. Those two sides of the universe become causally disconnected. So as we go forward into the universe, we won't be able to see at some point the edges of the universe, the ones that we see today. And that will become progressively closer and closer and closer to us till we can no longer see what's outside of our own galaxy. So uh, be happy that you live in the universe in the stage that you live within it. I hope you're all doing well and staying safe. Take care.